Well, please find your way in your Bible to Psalm 85, the book of Psalms, number 85, Psalm 85. I want to try to walk you through this psalm today, and I'd really like to help you to pray for revival, to pray for revival. Why, why don't Christians pray for revival? Do you even believe that God really could do that today? Do you believe it? Do you believe God could change us, actually change you and me so much that he would make this church one which is full of the Holy Spirit and of power and boldness, just like it was in the church that we read about in Acts chapter 4. Would you, would you believe that was possible? Do, do you even believe that that kind of a transformation is something that God can bring about in a, in a, in a, in a people, in individuals, in, in a church, in a generation? Can, can God revive the church? And what would that do? Um, just under two weeks ago, it was on the 8th of February, there were some students who refused to leave a chapel service. It was a university chapel service in Asbury University in Kentucky in the United States. They just stayed on at the end of the service, and they stayed on to pray and to sing, a little group of them. And then as the day went on, more and more and more students began to join that group, and by the evening, uh, it, the place was packed, and this is now the 11th day of one continual meeting that has been taking place in that university chapel. They're calling it revival. Thousands of people from all over the United States and even from around the world are traveling to that place in Kentucky to... to get a, a, a sense of what is happening in that university campus. The last time this happened, strangely, it was in 1970 in the same chapel in the same university, Asbury University. What happened there in 1970 spread across the United States. It went from university campus to university campus. It spread to different churches, and it became a whole phenomenon, a whole movement, the Jesus movement of the 1970s. Suddenly there were lots and lots and lots of hippies reading their Bibles and talking about Jesus, the Jesus people in America and in, in England, the Jesus army, a bunch of Hippies, all about Jesus. It was a real phenomenon. There were all sorts of problems, theological problems, unbiblical theology mixed up in that. And there were lots of weird things going on. There were also lots of people reading their Bibles. And, and out of that, when people read their Bible, some good things really did happen. A lot of people were truly saved. And um, genuine Christians among all those people were beginning to discover that actually they, they needed teachers who could teach them the Bible that they were reading. And they began to flock to churches where the Bible was taught. Um, the Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa in California, pastored by Chuck Smith, where he just taught verse by verse through the Bible. 
John MacArthur's church in California, where he taught verse by verse through the Bible, uh, R.C. Sproul's TV ministry, just all of them just exploded during that period of time when there were thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people reading their Bible and, and saying, we need, we need to understand this. I mean, you, you can't deny the phenomenon. You, you can question an awful lot about what happened in that revival in Asbury University in 1970, but um, what do we say about what's happening now in the same university? My answer is I don't know. I, I, I've, I don't know yet about this revival, as they're calling it, in, in that university campus. But I've, I've seen enough, and I've read enough of the history of revivals um, it, that do happen in church history. I, I've read enough to make me cautious. Cautious about insisting that th things are from God, for sure, when th there can be really very human imitations of a real work of God. But also cautious about dismissing it out of hand uh, without some very clear analysis from someone who really knows what's going on um, and someone who has made a proper detailed analysis. And so um, I, I would just say this to you, church, I, I'm, I'm kind of bringing this up because if you're in the Christian um, social media world at all, if you're even going on national television in America, where I don't know if it's hit the national news networks in the UK yet at all, but it's a talking point, a big talking point on the national news networks, all of them in America, this phenomenon that is taking place right now, you're going to hear about it. How are you going to think about it? What do you, how do we assess something like this? Well, the history of revival and revivalism should make us very cautious to make emotional judgments one way or the other. Uh, Ian Murray has written a, an excellent book with that title, Revival and Revivalism. I've put it on the desk by the welcome sign there, along with some other books. There are some very good books on this subject. It's been very well researched. Jonathan Edwards lived through times of revival, and he wrote a lot about it. It's collect his writings are collected and modernized in a little book by Banner of Truth, uh, Jonathan Edwards on revival. Brian Edwards, a more modern writer, uh, one that I met some years ago, wrote, wrote a, a book called Revival, A People Saturated by God. Again, published by Banner of Truth. Ex oh, no, it's not. It's, I think, Evangelical Press. It's there. You can have a look at it afterwards. Uh, and then there's a, a very helpful little history of the some, you can read the history of some revivals like the 1859 revival in Northern Ireland or the 1859 revival in Wales or, and Britain that, that are just unquestionably mighty works of God. And that's been well analyzed. There's another book down there about the history. So I'd recommend this would be a good time if you want to think about the subject of revival, have a look at those books. They are not for sale, by the way. Those are, those are staying in um, possession of Tom Dreon, please, because uh, I need to reread them. But I want to take them home with me today. But you maybe want to take a photo. You can, they're all still available in the shops, and uh, you can get hold of that, and this would be a great time to be thinking about it. We don't want to react in the wrong way to what we hear in the news, do we? Um, but the reason I'm bringing up this reality and this, re this thing called revival, the re I'm going to be preaching to you today about how to pray for revival. I want to bring this up again as something that we, we really need to be doing. Do you, do you heartily, regularly, 
persistently, like we were taught the other week, pray, beg God to revive us again. The psalm, which I will read to you in a minute, has this verse, verse 6. Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? That's the prayer that characterizes the heart of this psalm, and I want us all to walk away praying it with all our hearts, um, and, and keep, to keep praying it with all our hearts. And do you, Let me just ask you again, do you really believe that God could radically change us? And do you believe that we need this revival? I do. Let me just say, uh, I, I personally, when I think about you and I think about all that I see God doing in you and among you as, as Grace Life London, I, I am consistently, repeatedly super encouraged. And I give thanks to God genuinely and consider myself unimaginably blessed in this generation to be the pastor of a church where I can see God working among the people and I see growth and I see change and I see God's blessing and I praise God for it. I even praise God for the growth and the change and the blessing of God in my own life, changing me and encouraging me. And, and yet I hate my weakness. And I hate the pathetic nature of my, the pathetic lack of boldness. And I, I hate the fact that here we are in London 0.004% of the population in this church, approximately. 0.004% of the population. And then you look at times of revival. I was reading to Donna last night some accounts of revival in parts of Wales that we know. And the... <laughs> The prayer meetings became the prayer meetings for the very few people who were left unsaved in that town. And the police stations had nothing to do. The schools were changed. The families were changed. Family worship was restored. In every home, you could walk down the street and hear the sound of singing. You, you, people, instead of on their, way, on their way back home from work, instead of hearing cursing, you heard people singing hymns as they went home. I mean, it's just an unimaginable change that you, you, you can't particularly take in until you read the history. And, and yet, um, I see... I see us and I see our situation and um, I, think, I think we're just kind of in low power mode as a church still. The other week I was trying to upload our family Bible time video to YouTube and I just couldn't figure out why the screen kept turning off. Uh, and I'd go back to check on it because it wasn't uploading properly even the Wi-Fi wasn't working properly, and I kept going back, and I was like, why has it gone off? Why has the phone gone off? I just couldn't figure it out. I plugged it in to the, I plugged it into the charger, and the, the screen kept turning itself off, and then I noticed that the battery sign was a light orange color, and if you've got an iPhone, you know what that means. It's, it's in low power mode. What? I was thinking, what's wrong? And it's not working properly, and, and I realized, okay, it's low power mode. So I googled low power mode. It turns out in low power mode that all sorts of things don't work properly, like 5G, um, or it doesn't check for emails automatically, and there's kind of different features that drop off, including, very annoyingly for me, it turns off the screen after 30 seconds of being on. So there was the solution to my problem. But do you ever feel as though... As a church, we're kind of not quite functioning as we were supposed to. You read a passage like Acts chapter 4, 
And, and you hear the church praying, praying for boldness. And God shakes the building and they're all filled with the Spirit and boldness. And they go out boldly proclaiming the Word of God despite the fact that the society around them was full of threats. Full of threats. Do you, do you feel as though the threats are building up? Do you feel as though the net around us as God's people who are unwilling to change the message, do you feel as though the net is closing around you? I do. Now, what's our response to that? I was in a church in September with a pastor, and we were talking about persecution that they receive. This was in Israel, in Jerusalem. And they get persecuted. They get persecuted for being Christians there. It is hard. It's hard to find a building you can meet in. It's hard to find people that will do business with you at all once they know that you're Christian and Jewish. I mean, it's like anathema to the whole society. Uh, and I, I was talking to this guy, I was saying, well, uh, he was telling me they've been through a time of peace with not much persecution. And, and I said something like, oh, that's, that's really lovely. You know? <laughs> he said, no, no, I called the elders together and we fasted and prayed to find out which of us was sinning um, because they'd stopped persecuting us. You know, I mean, persecution, he said, if anyone desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, he will be persecuted. I'm like, yeah, I probably need to talk to our elders about that. <laughs> He's got a point. He's got a point. It, we laugh, don't we? But when was the last time you were really living such a godly life that people persecuted you for it? That, that, that is the normal Christian life. So do you feel like your own individual Christian life is on low power mode? What about the connections between you and God? I mean, is, is, is that 5G working or, or, or is the connection a little bit slow? Uh, are the messages coming both ways? Uh, are you, are, what's your prayer life like? Now I'm, I'm, I'm treading on forbidden territory, aren't I? Because you, you know that it's kind of, it's almost an agreement that you come to church and your pastor keeps you comfortable. But you came to the wrong church. If that's the case, and this has to be the church where we re-examine, where we re-examine and re-examine and re-examine our lives in the light of this book, not the way it's always been, right? Agreed? So, what do we do? How, how do we get out of low power mode? We're, we're talking about the need for revival. A definition of revival would be God bringing life where there was life. So first of all, let me just start here. You have to be a Christian. You have to be born again to be revived. Maybe you've stepped in today and, and you're not even yet born again. You don't act, you've never actually had a connection with God. If I can put it in phone terms, you've never been plugged in to God and you, you've never been charged. <laughs> well, you can't be in low power mode. You're just in no power mode because you're dead. That's what the Bible says about you. As for you, you were dead. Uh, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. That's what Paul says to the, to the Ephesians, isn't it? Chapter 2, verse 1. You were dead. But this is the glory of the gospel is you can go from being dead, spiritually dead, to alive. And listen, when you were first alive, if you were a Christian, when you were first alive, were you just a little bit charged? Were you on like 3% when you were first alive? No, you go from being dead to alive, don't you? When you come alive spiritually, you've got to tell people about Jesus. Why? Because he saved you. Because he forgave you. And by the way, if you didn't go from death to life, if you didn't go from, from no relationship to God to, to, to a relationship with God, which is pr praying, 
one of the first signs that you're truly born again is that you pray because it's, it's like breathing for a Christian, as Spurgeon put it. It's just like, it's natural to you when you're born again. The Holy Spirit it works in you and you pray. You pray, Abba, Father, the, the Spirit teaches you that. You don't need to be told, you just pray because you're saved. And, and, and this is wonderful, isn't it? But then you can go from being on full power mode, full of boldness, full of zeal, full of love, and then you can lose your first love, can't you? And your prayer life can dry up. Instead of checking your messages from God every day, and maybe several times a day, checking to see what God has said to you, 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 put, you put the book down. And maybe you're checking your messages from your friends or your social media updates instead. And it's a disaster, isn't it? And then you're limping along and wondering what's wrong, but it's because you're in low power mode. So listen, I'm, I'm just putting this to you as an illustration to say, do you, need, do you need revival? Listen, if you're still dead, what you need is repentance. And you need forgiveness for the first time. You can get that today. Come to Jesus. Jesus calls you to come to him and to be born again and he will save you if you don't know how to do that if you don't want help come speak to someone there's a whole team of people would love to help you pray with you do anything with you to help you to know him but for the rest of us do we need revival how do you would you like some help with how to pray for revival now, i i I believe that probably in response to what's happening, happening in, in Kentucky right now, you're going to see revivals advertised. Let me just say something. You can't advertise for a, a revival. You can't organize a revival. You can't engineer a revival. You can pray for a revival, right? So how do we pray for real revival? Let's learn in this psalm to the choir master, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Okay, a psalm. It was a song. It was a song written by the sons of those rebels. It was a song written, um, it seems, after the return from exile, We'll see that come out in the psalm, perhaps. I'll show you why I think that as we go. But it was a psalm written for God's people to sing. And it's containing this prayer for revival. So we say, okay, basic deduction, Sherlock. Um, it's, a, it's to teach God's people how to pray for revival. That's why they gave it to God's people to sing so that we could know how to sing and pray for revival. So that's what I want to do is I want to take you through this psalm. It's a wonderful psalm. I want to just walk you through um, really four uh, things that you, you need to believe about God that are really obvious here in the psalm if you're going to pray properly for revival. So four things you have to believe about God so that you can pray as the Bible would have us pray for revival. Let me read the psalm to you and then I'll just walk you through those one at a time as we break down the psalm and I'll bring it out as best I can. Let's read the psalm. Verse 1, Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. Selah. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation from us toward us. 
Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God, the Lord, will speak. For he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, but let them not return back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we beg you that you would open our eyes, that we can see wonderful things in your law. Teach our hearts how to pray. Lord, we need you. We need the real thing. We need more of you, Lord. More of your power, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives more of the fruit of the Spirit manifest in our lives, more answers to our prayers, more prayers to have answers to. Lord, we need more of everything, and so we pray that you'd have mercy upon us, please, and forgive us our sins and help us even now. Lord, help us as we grapple with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you want to look back at this psalm, first of all, in verses 1 and 2, verse 1 and 2, look at that. You've got to notice that this psalm itself was not written to us, it was written to the people of Israel. And in verses 1 and 2, they, the people of Israel, were taught to bring up with God the fact that he had revived his people Israel in the past. Now, then there's a pause, Selah. And then from verse 3 down to verse 7, it picks up with the same thought, but, but starts then with the idea that God was angry. But he turned from that hot anger. And in this section, in verses 3 to 7, the prayers for revival begin. And they begin with the central thought, very simply, that God is angry with his people. And a prayer for revival is a prayer for God to turn away from his anger with his own people. You've got to get that if we're going to get the meaning of this psalm. The third section of the psalm is from verse 8 to the end, and it seems as though God's people are being taught to remember and to focus on God's willingness to actually bless his people when they fear him and repent, to focus on his willingness. Now, there's a catch in the psalm um, that if you were reading it in Hebrew, it would jump out from the page and slap you in the face, and you wouldn't be able to miss it. If you're not reading it in Hebrew, you can easily miss it. Um, unless you're you're kind of counting things as you go. But we'll come back to that at the end. I'll point it out to you as my fourth point, but the structure for my sermon is going to be working through those three sections to the psalm and then coming back at the end to highlight the catch and to point that out to you. I want to show you these four things you have to believe about God in order to properly pray for revival. Are you with me? Number one, the first thing you have to believe is to believe that God is merciful. Merciful. This is in verses one and two. Um, Praying properly for revival actually means you, you believe that God does revive his people. Look at verse one. Lord, you were, past tense, favorable to your land. You restored 
the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sins. All that is history. And this is one of the things that points me to the fact that I believe the psalm was written after the exile, after the return from exile, probably in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. We read about the return of some of the sons of Korah, and I reckon it was written in, in those days. And there's other things here that persuade me and, and others about that. Um, the, the, the point here is that this is all talking about the history of the people of Israel. There, there were times, there was a time they could look back on when God had restored the fortunes of Jacob. That's the Old Testament people of God as the people of Israel. Jacob's other name was Israel. And the, these are the descendants of Abraham. So these are um, the people who, to whom the land, the, prom, the land had been promised, the promised land, the land of Canaan had been given by God. Genesis 12, verse 3. The Abrahamic covenant had been made with this people. It was their land. And actually this whole psalm and so many of the Old Testament promises were connected with the land. And, and this psalm focuses on God's being favorable to his land as a sign of his favor, of his blessing upon his people. Uh, the reason for that is, is so intimately connected with the first five books of the Bible that you just can't understand this and you can't understand the history of, of the, the people of God if you don't carefully read books of the Bible like Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Why? Because in so Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, you've got the blessings upon the people of God in the land of God connected with their obedience to the covenant that God had made with them, right? Blessings for obedience. And, and what else? Curses for disobedience, right? So Deuteronomy 28, verse 3. If you're quick, I'm going to be reading a few verses here. Blessed, God speaking to his people Israel, blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. This is, these are the blessings if they obey. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle and the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Does anyone have a kneading bowl? Blessed shall you be when you come in. Blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your barns. Anyone got a barn? And in all that you undertake. And he will bless you in the land. Anyone got a land that the Lord your God has given you? by promise, by covenant, no, unless you happen to be an Israelite, in which case, yes, that is your land, given by promise, given by covenant, if you're an Israelite. The rest of us have to look in from the outside and say, this is the people of God, and the blessings are connected with the, their prosperity in the land of God, and all these are very earthly blessings, aren't they, connected with their, their obedience to the covenant. And then there's the curses, and they're reciprocal. Verse 16, cursed shall you be in the city. Cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in. Cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, frustration in all that you undertake to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. The Lord will make pestilence stick to you until it has consumed you off the land that you are to entering to take possession of it. The Lord will strike you with a wasting disease and with fever, inflammation, fiery heat, and with drought, and with blight, and with mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish, and the heavens over your head shall be bronze, and the earth underneath you shall be iron. The Lord will make the rain of your land powder, from heaven, dust shall come down on you until you are destroyed. The Lord 
will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. And guess what? It happened. It happened. They sinned. They rebelled. They did not obey. And God brought those curses, those exact curses, literally to pass upon the nation of Israel in the land of Israel until they were destroyed and until they were expelled, exiled from the land of Israel. But then there's some other promises made to the people of Israel. So this is in the sort of reiteration of the uh, Davidic covenant when Solomon dedicated the temple to Chronicles 7. God responds to that dedication of the temple with promises. And he says, verse 13, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, listen, if my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their, what does it say? Land. Land. Okay. The blessings for obedience, the curses for disobedience. Oh boy. They had sinned, hadn't they? And they literally were cursed in the land because of their sin. And God booted them out. But then they began to humble themselves and seek his face. And he restored them to their land. And, and, and God did it then, the, the rest, restoration from exile after Babylon, 70 years and Daniel's prophecy and prayer. And, and then they came back. And you say, God heard their prayer. Um, but you know that wasn't the end of it, but, but it, happened, it happened to some degree, the blessings and the curses in one degree or another, again and again and again, depending on their disobedience and depending on their repentance. And God connected the blessings on the people of Israel in the land of Israel with their obedience and repentance. And we say, Praise the Lord, this is written to Israel. Praise the Lord. We can read in verses 1 and 2 that God, despite the sin of his own people in his face that you read about in the Old Testament, offensive, abominable, unbelievable disobedience on the part of his people Israel, Despite that, God was still willing to hear their prayers when they humbled themselves and sought his face and prayed. He restored them. He restored the land. He kept his promises. Now, people of God in the New Testament, church, Jew and Gentile in one body. I'm praying that Jews will come and be added to this body. We're all Gentiles, aren't we, I think. Tell me if you're a Jew. I'd love to know, but... Uh, I'm praying for Jews and Gentiles in one body in London just to show the world. I'd like Jews and Palestinians here, by the way. Join me praying for that. Um, but here's the thing. Okay, I don't believe the church has replaced the nation of Israel. But we are the New Testament people of God. That people of God language applies to us. You can't write that out of the New Testament. You come to the New Testament, you say, say the church... It's the temple of God. God's spirit dwells in us. This is, big, this is a big deal theologically. All right? We don't have promises of land like the nation of Israel had promises of land. This is written to them. But listen, does God deal with us like God dealt with them? Yes. God disciplines churches. Read Revelation 2 and 3. God blesses churches. Read Revelation 2 and 3. 
It's pretty straightforward. God deals with his people in the same basic way. And the first lesson for us in verses 1 and 2 is to remember, listen, okay, we, we look at ourselves and we say we don't have what people in days gone by had. We don't have what the New Testament church had in terms of being on full power. We don't seem to have the boldness that we should have or the Jesus said, let your light so shine that people will see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. And the church is supposed to be a city set upon a hill that cannot be hid. And we say, look, we're hid. We're just like, nobody takes any notice of us. I preach about embrace your gender a few years ago. You know, we're right between Stonewall on one side and a lawyer's company on the other side that litigate those kind of cases. Nobody even noticed. No persecution, no trouble. We're just ignored. People look at us patronizingly and say, they're there, and go away and just talk about us. But that's about as bad as it gets for most people most of the time, isn't it? And, and you say, well, what's wrong with us? Where, where is it our holiness? What, what is it, Lord? Okay, there's some different answers we could try and put to that. But here's the question, whatever it is. If we have sinned, if, God's, if the lack of God's blessing is, a comp- is because of the lack of, uh, of God's blessing, because he's looked at us and decided not to bless us, how do you pray for revival? Are we fatalistic? No, God is merciful. So the first step in really praying for revival is believing that God is the kind of God who would hear our prayers. Do you believe it? So what I'm trying to encourage you to do, Grace Life London, is to believe that God would hear our prayers for mercy. And part of it is saying, Lord, you've done it before. And by the way, church, you need to read the history of revival to believe and, and, and listen, read and you will read and weep. If you never read the history of If you can't read, YouTube it, the history of revival, and be careful what you YouTube because there's a whole mess of bad stuff thrown in. But I could maybe give you a few links. Links speak to me about that. But read the history of revival and read and weep. You will weep. You'll You'll be reading and saying, Lord, do it again, Lord. You could, you've you've done it before. Do it again. And that's really the point. In order to pray like that, you have to believe that God would because he's merciful. Now, the second thing you have to believe in our list of three, uh, four things you have to believe about God in order to pray properly for revival, you've got to believe that God is also angry. Verses three to seven. Now look at this. Um, I'm not going to apologize for this, but just, just look at verses 3 to 7. You withdrew all your, what is it? Wrath. You turned from your hot anger. If you're inductive Bible study, you're underlining this already. Restore us again, O God of our salvation. Put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger toward all generations? Will you not revive us again? There's the prayer at the heart of it. But at the, uh, this prayer is set in the context of acknowledging, like, like Daniel did, acknowledging, like Nehemiah did, God, you've been angry and rightly angry with us. And now there's a tendency among many Christians to believe that just because you're saved, God, God's no longer it's no longer possible for God to be angry. <laughs> okay, well, in terms of justification and your status, if you're truly saved, that is true. Praise the Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? But can we sin in a way that God makes, that it makes God angry enough to discipline us? Well, yes. The Corinthians did. Yes. Ananias did. The next chapter from what uh, we read. Uh, yes, you can sin yourself to death by discipline from God as a Christian. And read Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 
and you'll read about churches to, to whom Jesus says, if you will not repent, I will come and fight against you. A church. Or repent and do the deeds that you did at first. Otherwise, I'm going to come and take away your candlestick. Would that, would that you were hot or cold, but as it is, you're lukewarm and I'm going to spew you out of my mouth, says Jesus to a church. I mean, that doesn't sound like Jesus is just okay with it all, does he? He's not just looking down from heaven and saying, oh, they're justified, that's fine. No, there were sins in those churches and in those people, sins that they were tolerating, sins that they thought were okay, that were making God angry with them. Now, this is a recognition that God's anger is connected with the need for revival. The prayer for revival, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you, is in the middle of a section that recognizes God is angry. Are you with me? So what do you need to believe about God? You have to believe he's angry. Now, let's just stop for a second. What kind of things could make God angry with you or with us? as a church? What about as a generation? Remember, there were, there, were, there were kind of cultural sins in the Old Testament that the Jews just were used to. It was the, they were the sins that were always there, the high places, that, that none of the kings seemed to ever get around to removing. And it gets mentioned again and again and again, and it gets mentioned by God in the, in the reasons why he's dealing with them. What about the, 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 those altars at Bethel and Dan? The sins that Jer with, with Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, taught Israel to sin. This, it's just like every single, it's like 200 years of kings coming and going, but never dealing with that sin that was the most offensive sin to God, but they just were used to it. It was just normal. Could there be things that we think are just, oh, everyone's done that. It's always been done that way. That's just normal. That's just the way church is. And what about other things? If you go to Revelation 2 and 3, like you, know, you tolerate that woman Jezebel who teaches my servants to commit sexual immorality or you, you, you have people, the, the Nicolaitans, the Nicolaitans, maybe they were having all things in common as well as their wives. That's one theory about, a very ancient theory about what the sins of the Nicolaitans were. Whatever those sins, there are certain sins that God is not okay with. I mean, top of the list, you'd say sexual immorality, right? But then also, what about losing your first love? So what kind of sins among us? This could be a good topic for Wednesday night. <laughs> Careful, fellowship group leaders, how you handle this. But... This is a serious thing, isn't it? What kind of sins could there be? What about, what about prayerlessness? Is that a sin? What about lacking zeal? What about lukewarmness? What about the sin of the lack of evangelism? What about pornography? What about if I asked all the husbands in the room to turn to your wife at some point today to look into her eyes and tell her that you've not watched porn in the last week? What about that? Be a good idea, wouldn't it? Be a good idea if you could do that and, and not lie. You know that the place of liars is in the lake of fire. What about, where are, by the way, all the men, the powerful men who lead family worship, who lead in godliness in the home, who lead their homes in being evangelistic to their neighbors? What's changed? Spurgeon lamented it. I was reading a sermon of his, listening to someone read a sermon of his 
the other day on revival, and he lamented it. And the way he lamented it made me think we ought to be doubly lamenting it. What's happened? Why, where are the men who are teaching their children the Bible, teaching their children godliness by example, by where are the men that are leading their wives? Um, I'm, I'm just going to say it, not pointing the finger at anyone in this room. I'm thankful and hugely thankful for so many of you, but I'm going to say it. It's a general reality in our generation that most men are spiritually crippled, and I think, it's just my opinion, I think the answer to that is sin. They've either frittered away the years that they should have been learning the Bible on computer games and inconsequential things, or they've sinned away their relationship with God by looking at things that God hates and judges and disciplines. And if they're Christians, they are weak. And, and, it's, and it's shocking. And, and I, I'm not speaking specifically about the sins of women right now, but I'm just saying we could, we could do a whole thing on the sins of women, couldn't we, ladies? Yeah? I'm just giving that as just one example. What a thing for us to face up to this reality. What if God was angry with us? What if there's something in your life and you're like limping along? Yes, you plug into God, you pray, and you, you, you recharge a little bit. But you only ever get to 2 or 3%. And then you limp along and like you're still in low power mode and, and nothing really seems to work much and the screen switches off every 30 seconds and, and you go blank and, and you're, not, you're not connecting and what's wrong? You're still a Christian, great. You were saved, great. You're going to go to heaven, great. Where's your fruitfulness? What, where are the rewards you're earning up? Well, you, you've grieved the Holy Spirit. And you quench the Holy Spirit. And there's, where's the power in your life? Where's the boldness for evangelism? Where's the, the joy from the prayer life that you have? Where's it all gone? Well, what if God was angry? The second thing you have to realize about God, if you're going to truly pray for revival, is God is angry. And, and God is right, right to be angry. And, and so coming to God means recognizing that and repenting of it. Whatever it is that your conscience is telling you needs to be repented of. Look, let's repent of it. If we need to search our hearts, let's search our hearts. Um, this is real stuff, isn't it? The third thing that you need to be convinced about, about God, in order to properly pray for revival is the reality that God is willing. <laughs> so we kind of dealt with this at the beginning. But I, I just want to show you, this is how the psalm ends. Uh, and I want to point to what the psalmist was doing with the people of Israel, and then there's a huge application for us. And it's this basic idea that, is God willing to revive us? Well, I'm going to say, you have to believe that God is willing to revive you if you're going to truly pray with faith for, for revival. Um, verses 8 to 13, this is such a fantastic section. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. See how it's... It's all land-based, <laughs> and glory did dwell in their land, literally, when they were being blessed by God, right? And, and this is what they were longing for. Um, now, I think in verse 10 through to verse 13, the psalmist goes all prophetic on us. And it seems as though he's looking into the future. It's all future tense, and he's looking into the future and kind of seeing a time when this happens to the nation of Israel. I believe this is yet to be fulfilled, and it's still to come for the nation of Israel. But it's beautiful. Look at this. 
Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. What's he saying? God is going to do it. I can see he's going to do it. Now, this was promised, by the way. It's right back in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 28, blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. You need to know Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. The Lord promises to circumcise the hearts of the nation of Israel. He promises to deal with their stubborn, sinful hearts. And, and he promises that you read Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 to 10, put it down as your homework, and he promises in that passage to, in connection with their, he's going he's to circumcise their hearts and cause them to truly call out to him in repentance, and then he's going to bless them and restore them in response to that repentance so much, listen, that he will make them more prosperous and more numerous than they ever were before. Oh, that's a guarantee of national salvation and, and future restoration of the nation of Israel. Now, why do I say that? Well, because it ain't ever happened. So, oh, it happened, didn't it happen uh, when they came back from exile? No. No, they, they were promised that they would be in connection with the blessings for obedience, that they would be the head and not the tail. They would be in charge, not the underdog. They would, their, their enemies would scatter from them. Well, when they came back from exile, they were still under the thumb of the Persians, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans. You say, well, didn't it happen when Jesus came? No, <laughs> When Jesus came, there were lots of people gathered into the kingdom, praise God, and then Jesus created the church at Pentecost, and Jew and Gentile in one body, but they were never more numerous and prosperous than before, and the blessings on the land were not fulfilled. In, re in response to their repentance, the, the remnant of Israel repenting did not bring about the fulfillment of the promises to restore them to the, the position of prosperity and, and, and uh, prominence connected with the land of Israel. Those promises were very physical and land-based, and they ain't happened yet. And, and Peter in Acts chapter 3 is still looking for the day when God will pour out his blessing upon the people of Israel when they repent and, and bring about all the promises that the prophets of old spoke about. So there's a future for the nation of Israel in the land of Israel, as far as I'm concerned, at least you know where I stand. Why am I saying all of this? I believe the prophet here, the, the psalmist, is looking forwards into the future and saying, guys, it's, hap it's going to happen one day. It's going to happen one day. Listen, how can the people of Israel Pray that God would revive and restore them with any confidence. He fulfilled the curses literally. Is he going to fulfill the curses literally and then just fulfill the promises spiritually and apply them to the church? No, he's going to keep consistent with his word and he's going to fulfill the promises literally. If they repent, they've got to believe God is willing to restore them. And he's put his willingness on paper. He's put it in black and white. He said, I am willing. <laughs> I'm going to, not, not just willing, intent. I'm going to do this. Praise the Lord. He's committed to it. They have that promise. That's what I'm saying. So they can pray with confidence. Hang on a minute. What, what promises do we have? We're the church, right? What kind of promises do we have? Well, what about the promise that I will be with you always, even to the end of the age? That promise, more than any other, gives me the courage to go out and to pray for revival in this church and in this city and in this nation and in this generation. And I do. 
And then I read Revelation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is the, it's the voice of Jesus to the church of Jesus, to believers. And, and, and as the picture is Jesus is willing and he's commanding his churches in the book of Revelation to repent. And the command to repent includes a, an implied promise, doesn't it? Why would he tell us to repent if he was just determined to leave us as we are and judge us? No, the, the command to repent implies a willingness to bless upon repentance. So can I put it to you, church? God is willing. Will we pray? Will you pray? Why is it that we have a church prayer meeting downstairs every week and we have to have it in a really small room, otherwise it would feel really bad? Why is that? I mean, you could get out of bed earlier and come earlier, couldn't you, and attend the prayer meeting if you really felt like it was important and we could pray for the Lord's blessing upon this church. Times of revival in days gone by, They've had prayer meetings, not just in the morning before church. They've had prayer meetings literally like every night. They've, they've had prayer meetings. That people have committed themselves to pray. The 1859 revival really started in New York in 1857 when a guy in New York started trying to knock doors and evangelize and then said, you know, I'm never going to do it. I'd need 100 lives to get through all these people and take them the gospel. And so he started a, a lunchtime prayer meeting, 12 till 1 every day in the church. And that spread. And people would come and pray between 12 and 1. What were they praying for? Lord, revive us. Yes, but they were praying for the salvation of their family members. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And guess what? God answers prayer. And the family members were saved. On the Isle of Lewis, the people were praying for their family members and praying for their family members. And God poured out his spirit on the Isle of Lewis in 1949. Can I get that wrong? Yeah, 49. And suddenly on the Isle of Lewis, all these people started getting saved in just a sudden move of God in answer to these prayers and people rushed to the prayer meetings, but also the family members who were not on the Isle of Lewis, people walking along the streets of London, knowing nothing of what was happening in Lewis, who just got hold of by the Spirit of God and fell to their knees and repented, walking along the streets of London. Why? Because God answers prayer. So it, you've got to say, look, is God willing? God is willing. He's given us promises that we can plead. But will you, will you, will you pray? We have to believe if you're going to pray, obviously that God is merciful, also that God is angry. You've got to believe that God is willing. But last of all, there's a catch. Now, if you're reading it in Hebrew, you noticed it. Did anyone notice did it? You can notice it in England, in England. You can notice it in English if you're observant and you notice that every stanza in this poem, in this song, is just two lines long. And that's the basic unit of Hebrew poetry, two-line parallelism. Two lines, two lines, two lines, and different elements of each line parallel with each other and they, they make not a rhyme, Hebrew poetry doesn't rhyme, but parallelism, it's a little bit like spoken word poetry, that there must have been a, a connection that everyone saw that they thought of as poetry, and it, that's how they sang it. I don't know how they sang it, nobody knows. But then two lines, two lines, two lines, two lines, two lines, three lines, two lines, two lines, two lines. What's going on with the three lines? What's going on in the third line? Have you seen it now? Verse 8. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. Only let them not return back to folly. Oh, 
you've got to believe also that God is watching, isn't he? Christian, Christian. How many times? How many times do you have to go back to that sin? You know what it is, don't you? I don't know what it is. But you have yours and I have mine. And every Christian in the room has theirs. Now, is, is it something trivial? Or is it something that your conscience and the Spirit of God is speaking to you about and saying, that's it? You keep going back there, don't you? For the people of Israel, what was it? Idol idolatry? Marrying foreign women? It's one of the reasons I think this was written in Nehemiah, Ezra's, Nehemiah's time. I mean, ne Nehemiah literally tore out his hair if he had it. He pulled out some of his own beard. Then he got hold of some people who were repeating the sin and pulled out their beards. I mean, the guy was a nutcase. Don't think that I'm taking my pastoral, I'm not going to be pulling out beards today or hair. If I could get hold of my own hair, sometimes I would pull it out though. Don't you feel sometimes just so desperately gutted with yourself that you cry out with the Apostle Paul, oh, wretched man that I am, wretched man that I am, woman that you are. Well, you have to go on, don't you, to, ch to chapter 8 as well and say that, hold on a minute, Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then chapter 8, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, he will also give life to your mortal bodies. You can't use your wretchedness as an excuse to do nothing about your sin. If the Holy Spirit lives in you, sin shall not be your master. There will be nothing in your life that you cannot overcome with the power of the Holy Spirit and by prayer, right? And, and maybe there's practical things you need to put in place in order to keep yourself away from it and all sorts of things, lessons to learn. But listen, you are not trapped if you are a Christian. You are not stuck where you are if the Holy Spirit lives in you. So... Do you have to go back to that folly? No, you don't have to go back to that folly. Now, no, what do you need? What do you need? You need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, don't you? It's kind of almost a, 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 a cycle where you, you come back to saying, Lord, I need you to work in me so that I won't grieve you. Right. So go to... Go back to verse 6 and cry, will you cry? Cry to the Lord, will you not revive me again? I don't want to go back to that folly. Change me, Lord. Give me the power. Will you not revive your people again? That we, we don't do that. Lord, don't let us go there again. If you could push a button today. In fact, if you had a red button and a green button in front of you right now, and that red button said, stop the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. I want to carry on with that sin forever. And that green button said, do you know what? If, if I push the green button, this would be God completely removing from me even the ability to do that sin forever. I would, I would never again be able to do that sin. Would you push the green button? I would. That reassures me that the Lord has changed my heart. Because I'm like, I do it now. I think that's what happens in the, with the Lord changing you. It makes you willing to be a willing slave of him forever. You're, 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 you just long to die and get rid of your flesh and be just a, not sinning anymore. If you, if you wouldn't push it, if you wouldn't push it, you're not a Christian yet, I don't think. Because you're still unwilling to repent of that sin. You've got to face it. But if you would push that button, if you could push that button, that's a really good sign. <laughs> but if, listen, if you're, we don't have that button, sadly. 
What we do have is the command to pray and the promise that God will be with us and he'll help us by the power of the Holy Spirit. So instead of pushing the button, will you, will you get down on your knees? Spurgeon said, a whole church on its knees is irresistible. I think if we would do this, brothers, sisters, I do believe God would revive us. I don't know when. I don't know what it would look like. I don't know how things would change. I don't know how many of us would be having to confess a lot more sin than we've realized because God would bring it to the fore. But I do believe God would bless us because I believe that Full power is the normal Christian life. According to the New Testament, we are commanded to continually be being filled with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 5. That's, that's what we're supposed to be like. And when they were full of the Spirit, they were full of boldness. And they were full of love and they were full of praise and they were full of faith and they just lived that life. So Christian, believer, Beloved brother, beloved sister, will you pray? Will you pray? Father in heaven, we pray that you would please change us. Lord, we beg you to do what is necessary in our hearts no matter what it costs Lord do what is necessary revive us again that your people may rejoice in you please revive us again for the sake of your name that your name in this generation this generation that thinks the church is finished we pray that you would show them that you are not finished and you're not finished with your church Lord, please make us what we should be. Forgive us for what we are not. But come to us and stir us and revive us and change us and forgive us. Lord, lead us to be able to understand and see our sin. Please protect us from all the excesses and errors we ask you that you'd lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, do not let the enemy use even this to divide us or destroy us. We pray instead that you would use it by the power of your Holy Spirit to revive us and unite us and bless us for the sake of your name, that people would know that there is a living God in an age which is just saying, you are dead. Lord, your name is at stake. And you have put your name upon your church. And so until you come to take us away, please come to revive us. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.